You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Bark and Swagger on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Jody Miller Young. Today's show mixes fun, fashion, and freedom. My guest is one of the country's most visible advocates for pit bulls, a type of dog that, like the Doberman Pinscher and German Shepherd breeds before them, is the latest to get an undeserved bad rap from those who don't know better. I started rescuing myself very recently, and the four dogs I've rescued thus far are all pit bulls. Every one of them, despite the circumstances they've come from, and for two of the four, they were horrible ones, has shown themselves to be sweet, loving, and yes, very large lap dogs. So while I've known that pits were bred for many years ago to be great family dogs, here was my own first personal experience. So today's show will definitely be entertaining, but I hope it's also educational so that when you meet a pit bull, you don't automatically fear them. Deirdre Franklin also known as Little Darling, has come up with a very catchy, ingenious way to get her attention and show the pit bull in the fun-loving, family dog light they deserve. It's called Pinups for Pit Bulls and has become quite the phenomenon in the dog advocacy world. We're going to take a short break from our sponsor. When we return, you'll meet Deirdre, a former model, a master's degree holder in public policy who actually wrote her thesis on breed discriminatory laws and a fan of the canine that earned the name long ago of America's family dog. So don't go away. Grab your favorite beverage, get comfortable, and we'll be right back. We'll be right back after a short pause. Tired of wasting money on giant bags, boxes, and jugs of litter that don't last? Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter that lets you use less and get more. World's Best Cat Litter uses the concentrated power of corn to deliver outstanding odor control and easy cleanup. It's lightweight, 99% dust-free, and pet, people, and planet-friendly. It's even flushable. Make the switch to World's Best Cat Litter and save $2. Visit www.saveonworldsbest.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Bark and Swagger on Pet Life Radio. I'm Jody Miller Young, your host. We're here today with Deirdre Little Darling Franklin, founder of Pinups for Pitbulls, a fun, fashionable brand to showcase pit bulls in kitschy, pop culture-inspired settings as a way to advocate for them. She's been making a big impression in the dog advocacy world and is a very creative person I'm excited to introduce you to. So, hey, Deidre, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I am really excited to have you here. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. But in 2005, you were so fed up with rescues and shelters euthanizing these perfectly healthy, friendly, and adoptable dogs that you decided to do something about it. Most of those animals, right? Okay, so most of those animals, as we know today, were lumped under the category of pit bull, which is a certain look, I guess, that encompasses several specific breeds, right? That's correct, and it really depends on who you're asking what a pit bull is. We can we can definitely go into that as well if you'd like me to. Yeah, I would love to do that. But your involvement, championing them, advocating for them, started somewhere. So tell us about your first experience with a pit bull type dog and the impression or impressions they made on you. Absolutely. So um, I had grown up with German Shepherds most of my life. I was always a dog person, but I never really knew anything about pit bull type dogs until probably I would say the early 90s. I had a few friends that had pit bulls that just kept them as pets and they seemed very fun. They seemed very loving. They seemed a little strong, which was, I was a little like 100 pounds and five foot two at the time. So they seemed a little <laughs> bit uh, daunting to me. <laughs> yes. um, but I, they seemed also very affectionate and very fun. And then I was working in a shelter at the time. There was a private shelter in Philadelphia 
And that shelter had a kill policy for pit bull type dogs. So it meant that if people brought in a dog that they identified as a pit bull, that dog would automatically be euthanized regardless of how their dog's temperament was, what the situation was. They wouldn't even look to see if there was a breed specific rescue. They would just euthanize them. They basically said it was their insurance policy and that was their out to not have to adopt out these dogs. And so one day I was Actually, my dream dog was a wolf hybrid husky at the time. I didn't know much about them. I just thought they were pretty. But I'd always dreamed of having a husky. And so one day this lady brought in a dog that was a what looked like a pit bull, and she had looked like she'd probably just had puppies, a little overweight. Her nipples were dragging. And this lady had just been a good Samaritan, saw the dog loose, brought it in, thinking that she was doing the dog a service by not taking it to our local SPCA, and brought the dog to us. And so... The counter girl, unfortunately, told her, if you leave this dog here, the dog will be euthanized. And I just couldn't believe it, even though I knew that was our policy. I just had never seen it happen before. And I was looking at this dog who was so loving and so friendly and so eager to just, you know, hang out and be affectionate. And they were like, look, if you leave this dog here, she will be euthanized. That's our policy. What do you want to do? And the lady was like, well, I have dogs of my own. I don't have the ability to take them anywhere else or take this dog anywhere else, so I guess I'll just leave her here. And I was pretty dumbfounded by the whole experience, and I was asked to bring the dog back to a kennel and brought the dog back, was talking to the dog, you know, giving the dog affection and was promised the dog I would do whatever it took to make sure that she didn't actually get euthanized because it just seemed incredibly unfair to me. And at the time, I was like 18 years old, just for frame of reference. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was um, volunteering there pretty regularly. It was my only social life outside of just going to school and working. And so I brought her back while we were hanging out. And then I went back up front and said, look, can I just take the dog home and keep this from happening? And they said, no, it's too late. She's already on the paperwork. That's just our policy. Deal with it. And I found that just impossible to, to comprehend. So this was uh, about probably like 1996 or so. So there was no Google. There were no real pet finder sources or anything like that at the time, there wasn't a really great way to find a rescue. Mm -hmm. So I went home and I turned on my computer and I found the only rescue I could find that was breed specific and they were in Texas. And I sent them an urgent email begging them to please help me figure out what I could do for this dog, if anything. And they answered right away, which was amazing and um, unheard of. (laughs) And these Mm -hmm. days it's pretty unheard of. But back then, They answered me immediately and offered to contact the shelter. And so they contacted them, offered to find a way to be an intermediary for me. And the shelter still insisted that it was too late. They're going to euthanize the dog. That's their policy and deal with it. And again, we were now both of them. Even though you wanted to take the dog yourself and you had a shelter who was willing to pull the dog. Yep. Simply because she looked like what they identified as a pit bull, which was crazy. So, and I'd never, like I said, I'd never experienced it before. So even though I knew that was our policy, I just, until I actually saw it happen, I didn't really comprehend what that meant because I didn't really know anything about pit bulls. You know, I knew what everybody else thinks they know about pit bulls. So they offered to pull her and they they said, too late. We're going to euthanize this dog. Sorry. I never volunteered there again. And then the group who tried to help me called Chaco, they were in Texas at the time, said, look, we just pulled three different dogs. One was left for dead in the basement in Texas. If you're interested, you can apply for her and we could always have her shipped to you, but you'll have to pull a police report on yourself. And so I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> like, what am I, I'm like a suburban kid, like getting myself into this crazy world that I had no idea about. Mm. And so I was like, why would I have to pull a police report on myself? And they explained to me like to make sure I've never fought a dog and didn't have a record. So I had to go to my little town of Yardley, Pennsylvania, which at the time was a pretty small population, and ask them for a police report. And they laughed in my face. <laughs> so they gave me what I needed, though. And they were just like, are you sure you want to adopt a pit bull? And I was like, I don't know. I think so. You know, and I don't know what I'm getting into. This is a crazy experience already. And so a month later, I shipped this dog sight unseen. I had no idea what she looked like until the night before I got her. I got this dark picture of her in like a pole barn, which I could barely see what she looked like. And I just didn't know what I was doing. And my parents were thought I was insane. So they were like, why are you going to adopt a pit bull? What are you thinking? And But I was like, you know what, I'm just going to do it. It just seems like everything is falling into place how it's supposed to. And I just trusted that everything was going to work out. And I got picked the dog up from Newark Airport and uh, opened the crate not knowing what I was going to get. And this dog jumped out and kissed me all over. And it was definitely instant love. And that was my Carla Lou, who was was my first. Yeah, (laughs) Carla Lou. Yeah. Yeah. So she was like my soul dog. Yeah. So it was amazing. So, So I didn't know. Like, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anything about training, what she would require. And thankfully, she was 
about as easy as it gets. So she pulled a lot as a dog. That was like her only issue. So other than that, she loved cats. She loved people. She loved kids. She loved dogs. Oh, she was that is so going. amazing. And she yeah. had five <laughs> pinups for pit bulls, right? Yeah, she's the whole reason this exists. Yeah, I just was so scared that laws like breed specific legislation would come to our front door and uh, affect us personally. And I couldn't imagine what I'd seen already just from the shelter experience happening to anybody. I just couldn't believe that people love animals the way that they do, how you can tear somebody's family apart because a dog looks like something that I you know. think it, is It's horrifying. Else. It's horrifying what the stories that, that we read. What gave you the idea to go in the direction for pinups that you've gone in with this sort of pop culture meets kitsch uh, yeah. that's just so perfect? Thank you. So at the time, I was doing a lot of pinup modeling, a lot of boudoir modeling, just fun stuff, really just creative, artsy, silly, fun things. I was performing in burlesque a lot at the time, too, and I just loved oh, wow. dressing up. I loved the way that old classic Hollywood pictures looked. I just loved everything about that culture and really just liked the way that that the, the image that it portrayed, but also I liked the way that, you know, women were, times were changing for women at that point and women, women were being empowered and women were having all these new opportunities and pit bulls at the same time were our war hero dogs and dogs that people really yep. perceived positively at the time. And so I felt like here I have this opportunity where I know people who are photographers, I know people who are customers. Why don't I just throw a little calendar together that could bring some awareness and also simultaneously, you know, showcase some really fun people and fun dogs and the dogs that I was working with at a rescue at the time. And, um, you know, I just thought it would be this one-off Kinko's calendar, simple thing that I would just do, raise a little bit of money, and then, you know, life would go on. And little did I know that this would become, you know, 11 years later <laughs> what I'm doing every year. So, Did the first one take off, like, right away? No. So um, the first one was, it was kind of quiet. I think maybe I sold a few hundred copies if I was lucky, um, and all of that money went to the rescue I worked with at the time. And then it was 2007, so the year later, even though we always had to shoot the calendar a year ahead, so I started it in 2005, but the 2007 calendar took off because that's when the whole Michael Vick thing happened. Yes. And so I started getting calls from Associated Press from you know all these humongous press uh, outlets wanting to interview me about pit bulls and pin up and what am I doing and why am I doing it? And be just because it was the time when people were really paying attention and everybody was kind of taking advantage of that at the time. And mm -hmm. so I went from being somebody who just loved my dog, who wanted to speak on her behalf to people locally to a national advocate pretty much overnight. So I was already doing the work. I just didn't really, you know, I kind of had to catch up to the popularity of it. Yeah, well, the universe had other things in store for you. Uh-huh. I know, I've just kind of been going with it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So give people a little bit of a sense of what they see when they open up a pinups for pit bulls calendar. You've done different, you know, sort of themes, themes exactly. Yeah. But just give people an idea and then you'll also be able to see photos of this on the Bark and Swagger page of the Pet Life Radio site so you can see what we're talking about. But yeah, let people Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah, so some of my favorite ones. We uh, and since 2013, we sh we've shot exclusively with a photographer called Celeste Giuliano in Philadelphia, and her and her husband and their makeup and hair artists are kind of like a one-stop shop for everything, which has been amazing for us. So in 2013, we did a Norman Rockwell tribute calendar, which was one of my favorites that we ever did because all of these are office friendly, um, but they're still sexy. And we try to keep it as, you know, PG-13 as we can so that it's still um, something people can hang up in their kitchen. Um, <laughs> and but it we, is. It totally is. Yeah. But I know what you yeah, mean. Yeah, we like to keep it classy, fun. but you want to have a little bit of the edge to it. So yeah. so you might see like a thigh high, but then, you know, we always tell people you'd, you'd see more on the beach than you will in our calendar, you know. <laughs> um, so we like to keep it fun. But the Norman Rockwell one was really fun to do because he was so family oriented in a lot of the things that he did. And so we had like a baseball player or the girl by the pond or like with the kite or different things that he had done, we kind of re recreated. And then we did one called Agents of Adventure, which was all adventure themes. So we had like an Indiana Jones style picture. And then we had like a girl and a dog on a beach with TNT or like just fun. And I love that one. Kind of images. The, the yes. That's one of my on favorites. <laughs> And that picture, blow the place. I'm sorry. Yeah, totally. And that picture is amazing too, because that dog had been in a shelter in a no-kill shelter for eight years before oh he was finally adopted by one of our volunteers, which kind of worked out beautifully. Wow. That's yeah. So there's all these like special little moments, I feel like, in all these stories. One of the other my favorites from the Adrian Adventure was 
a space themed one we did and it was with a deaf dog who knew more more commands than any dog I've ever met and the dog could go backwards and forwards and flatten out and do all these different things but we had that dog in outer space with one of our pinups and it was just like the coolest most iconic picture I think one of the (laughs) coolest ones we've ever done that Um, sounds amazing yeah and then this year is one of my I think all time favorites because it's called Welcome to Darlingsville and what we did is we created a town where all dogs are welcome And so we have a florist, we have people, you know, just doing regular jobs or regular fun things, but in a really bright and poppy, fun way. So we have somebody at playing cricket. It's kind of like Peyton Place without the drama. (laughs) Thank you. Yes, exactly. Without all of the neighbors talking, although that kind of works perfectly too with the pit bull thing. (laughs) Somebody, (laughs) the neighbor is always getting involved. But yeah, so we wanted to create this really fun little town. And on the back, it's cool. We created like a map kind of when you go to a town and you visit and they have like where the antique stores are and where all the things are. But on the back of the calendar, we have a map similar to that that shows like all of our little town, like everybody together. And then we have we called it uh, Freedom Ride Road and like little names like that for the streets. And we just really wanted it to be something that ever made everybody feel like, oh, these dogs are just normal dogs, like ha- hanging out with their people who love them. And, yeah, you know, and that's really totally the are. end result we want people to have is like here, they're not the dogs that you're seeing from the cover of Sports Illustrated in the 80s. This is a dog who, you know, who just loves his person or her person and wants to be snuggled and fed and, you know, get ear scratches like everybody else's dog. You know? Well, like with most dogs, almost all dogs, it's the people. It's the people who raise them, who you know they spend their time with that shape the dog that they are. You know, and oftentimes these dogs, some of whom have been treated so so badly, still love and kiss and cuddle and just want to be your dog just want to you know want you to be their person despite what they've been through but it's it's not the dogs it's the people exactly and one of the things I always say is it's the person at the other end of the leash if there's even a leash at all you know which is another exactly critical element in the educating of the public about these dogs is you know exactly if you love these dogs if you care for them then you'll protect them and you'll make sure that they're safe and that's our job as you know their parents or their companion animal people or however you want to say it. Exactly. We we owe them that because they can't do it without us, you know? That's right. Well, we are their voice because they, they can't speak for themselves. So it's like with babies, you know, human babies. We're their voice. And we do. We have a responsibility as human beings. So now, in addition to these wonderful products, and we'll talk more about other products that Pinups for Pitbulls creates, but in addition to the products, you're also an education and obviously an advocacy group, and you work with shelters and rescues. Tell us a little bit about the kind of work you're doing with these organizations, and do you do so nationally as well? Absolutely. We did nationally, and um, we're growing internationally as well now. Um, So one of the I think one of my main points of pride with our organization, especially over the last few years, is we have a dedicated cross poster. And what that means is we have somebody who runs our social media page on Facebook who tracks the data on whether a dog that we post, we provide a courtesy post, gets adopted, finds foster home, gets pulled from a shelter, whatever it needed. So we track that data and we've only started tracking it over the last few years. And Mm -hmm. what we figured out is last year alone, we had, I think it was like 996 homes that we found for dogs just by using our popularity, um, the popularity of our page and helping cross post these dogs in need. And That's we do amazing. that for individuals who have dogs that need help um, homes. We do it for, you know, rescue groups, shelters, emergency situations, whatever it is, we will courtesy post. And as long as they update us, and we believe it's more than a thousand dogs, but those are the ones who just took the time to let us know how it went. And by doing so, we have almost three quarters of a million followers um, on our, our social media. So we notice that we have people who follow us just because of pinup, or we have people who follow us just because of rockabilly culture, let's say, or different reasons that Mm -hmm. uh, they Mm -hmm. they might have met us at tattoo conventions or comic book conventions. So we have like a cross hatch of a ton of different kinds of people. Instead of like a rescue or a shelter just posting up on their page where it might not get visibility, we're getting visibility for these animals on our page because we have such a diverse audience. And that diverse audience is really good at sharing and keeping people in touch. And so 
As a result, we've found that many homes just last year alone, like I said, almost a 1,000 this year in June. The last time I got an update on our numbers, we were close to 700 already. So it's pretty awesome. So we're just taking, we're not a rescue, we're not a shelter, but we're taking an opportunity that we have of here, let's work together. Let's show people that when you work together, you can do more. And, you know, a lot of people just want to be negative sometimes or just want to say that things don't work or that this doesn't work. And we try to do the opposite and focus on the positive and find ways to work together and elevate things and use what we have as our talents. We have a dedicated person whose only job is to do that for us, and she does an amazing job. And as a result, we're able to get, you know, take the burden off of all these shelters and rescues who don't have marketing abilities and market these dogs in front of a completely different audience so that's one of the main we have to talk we have to talk because i volunteer for a wonderful shelter down here in fort lauderdale called abandoned pet rescue and they won't even take pit bulls because they can't move the pit bulls that they have and we could so use your help thank you so much deirdre i'm so excited for them oh my i'm glad you i'm glad you mentioned that too is one of the other things so you were asking about how we work with shelters. So a few last year, last April, Grapevine, Texas had a no pit bull policy at their shelter. So similar to what I went through in Philadelphia, they basically, if they got pit bulls, they were euthanized because they had a policy against them. They just thought whatever the reason was that this policy went into place that they weren't adoptable. Mm-hmm. So we questioned them on that last year and we found out that it was uh, not the shelter who put that in place, but the sheriff's office and it's just a little city in, in Texas. So we called the sheriff's office and said, you know, why do you have this policy? Is there something that happened? You know, what is the reasoning? And and basically back and forth, we got out of it that they didn't really know. Somebody put it in place a long time ago and nobody ever asked why. So (laughs) all these dogs are being killed just because nobody ever said why. And so, so we said, well, can we sit down and have lunch with you and figure out what your concerns might be and see if we can support your shelter and support getting these dogs out if you're able to start adopting them out. And they said, yeah, well, let's talk about it and see. And so we had lunch with them. And within literally less than 30 days, we turned around their policy and they lifted their no pit bull policy and they now adopt them out at their shelter. And it was just really because we said, like, why? You know, yeah. what do you need? And and not only did we say why, or, you know, I think one of the problems um, in advocacy right now is a lot of people make assumptions about what's going on, and so they might create a change.org petition, for example, or they might tell their news uh, media source first and tell them that they can't believe that the shelter is doing this. But a lot of times people just don't ask the source. And so we mm-hmm. believe the opposite. Go right to the source. Find out what's going on, and if you don't like it, then take other routes, you know. But they basically were just a little town that said, we just didn't know. And now, you know, we changed it around. So that was just a really cool opportunity. Wow. and. Full circle back to the place that didn't let me adopt the dog in Philadelphia. They also asked me to lunch a few years ago and wondered why I always told the story and why they had that policy. One of their board members just didn't know. And, it, you know, the guy who started the shelter had basically always really hated pit bulls. And the guy on the board said, I don't really feel comfortable about this. Why are we doing this? And I said, it doesn't make any sense. Here's the science. Here's the data that you need. Here's everything you could possibly need. And if they want me to present to them in person, I can. Like, well, let's see what you need to do. And he went back to them. And it took a little while. It took maybe like six or eight months. But they also lifted their policy. And now they adopt out pit bull type dogs. And they use us as a resource to get them out. So how many really dogs a matter you of like saved? Being, My God, it's such a it's beautiful, pretty awesome. beautiful thing. <laughs> beautiful thing. You know, I Thank was... You. I definitely wanted to talk policy with you because, you know, I I was really impressed to learn that you went back and got a master's degree in public policy so that you could be an even better advocate for these dogs. And you're involved in other parts of the country and world in helping to get these bans, these BSL laws changed. I know when I met you, there was a big thing going on in Montreal. Tell us a little bit, just kind of touch on a couple of places around the world where you are active in trying to get breed-specific legislation laws turned around? Absolutely. So um, with Montreal, that situation started this summer. Um, There was a news story that came out that claimed that a pit bull type dog had killed a woman in her yard and in Montreal. And so this story came out, they reported it as a pit bull type dog. Months later, it turned out it wasn't a pit bull type dog. They also reported on that. But of course, that didn't get nearly as much traction as the story of somebody being killed, unfortunately. And so a lot of people didn't know that when the DNA test came back, it was 
a boxer mix of some kind, which had no pit bull type dog in it whatsoever. But people already had the idea in their minds, and this is how this all kind of starts, is people get an idea and it sticks because fear is a sticky thing and it's really hard to undo sometimes, um, even when we want to consciously. And so what happened was the mayor of Montreal decided that all pit bulls that lived there needed to be muzzled. And if any new pit bulls came in through the shelter system, they needed to be euthanized. And he was kind of on this tirade about it. And this happened in the beginning of summer. And so I got involved uh, with the, the veterinary orders, basically the, the equivalent to like our AVMA or things like that in the U.S. And I got involved with them and gave them my master's thesis, was willing to fly to Montreal to get, present to them all of the information that I had. Um, but part of the issue was with the language barrier. And so even though my mom is actually French speaking, my first language, uh, who she offered to come with me, they were really confident that they had everything under control. And I was working with the uh, Montreal SPCA at the time, and they were a lot more nervous that this was actually going to pass. And they were trying to work with the mayor's office and change his mind. But he really has it out for pit bull type dogs. For whatever reason, it is just his favorite thing to hate. And so even with science and logic, he listened to this organization who I will not name because I don't want to give them press. But he listened to this organization that is founded by a person who is a psychic, who is not a scientist. And uh -huh. um, well, she goes by, she had wrote a book on being a psychic. So I don't know if she is or not, but she's not a scientist. She has no background in animal welfare or behavior of any kind. But she runs a website and a media site that's extremely popular for people who hate pit bull type dogs. And they're the only organization out there that is our opposition. And so part of the problem was this mayor was getting information from that person. And he liked it because it agreed with what he agrees with. And so even though we were giving them all of the data they could ever need, this organization put a document together and they actually work with PETA. And PETA also really wants to see pit bulls gone. So they started working together and they put this document together, which I don't know if PETA helped write it or not, but they put a document together that said, here's what Best Friends is going to tell you. And here's what Animal Farm Foundation is going to tell you. And here's what all of these scientists or, you know, these organizations that work with scientists and behaviorists are going to tell you. And we're telling you that it's not true and that they're just the, quote, millionaire pit bull lobby. And they made it, they made it look like we're a bunch of nutcases and that they're right. And so... Mm -hmm. All the stuff that we're sending them, they're basically refuting by saying, uh-uh, not true. And that was basically their, their version of science. And so it made so what, a what's really the chaotic... Thing? What ultimately is happening? So what happened was it passed by... Uh, this was the other interesting thing. So the Montreal government, for whatever reason, the mayor has people who have to agree with him, who vote, have to vote a certain way if they're in his in his jurisdiction. I forget how exactly it's laid out. Their government's a little different than ours. But essentially what happened was everybody voted for breed-specific legislation because of all of this data that was coming out from this mm -hmm. other side. And then they voted for it, and then it was challenged immediately by the MSPCA. They went, to, they went above him in court and said, you know, this is ridiculous. There, nothing is based in science. This is what's going on. We're not going to take dogs in our shelter anymore if you're going to do this because we didn't become a shelter in order to kill dogs. We're here to support them and support the community. And so essentially they said, we'll just pull our, our contract with you and we'll only take cats and exotic animals if, you want, if you're really going to pass this which I thought was amazing because in the United States, nobody's ever had the guts to go that far. Mm. Um, so then the, uh, Supreme, their Supreme Court um, basically said, this doesn't look right. We need to evaluate this. So they put everything on hold. And thankfully, like literally within 24 hours of it passing, then it was put on hold. And then the mayor went back and challenged it back. So right now, everything is completely up in the air. And I believe it's the end of November that it's getting reevaluated now on like their Supreme Court level. Well, um, we'll so keep been, our fingers crossed yeah. that there's but some sense. It's been sense. very hairy because it's, it's, it's been so illogical that it, I've, it's mm. the only time I've ever fought BSL where somebody actually favored like complete insanity over woo -woo. science. They favored woo-woo yeah. over science. When yeah, you and say, he, he really said, he said, I, I don't care about science. I care about common sense was like, I think, a direct quote. And I was just like, the, what? <laughs> like, I just don't know. <laughs> I'm just like banging my head against the wall. Like, how do you fight? This like this isn't logic. Like there's no right, right. rhyme or reason There's to it. And so ignorant. this is like the most chaotic thing I've ever been involved in. And I think part of the reason it passed so hard, uh, aside from the fact that the media was really, you know, believing that this dog had killed this woman that was a pit bull type, which wasn't. At the same time, a cat killed somebody in Montreal, but they didn't go around and ban cats. And the fact that it was an at-large dog that had a history that the city knew about, 
which made it even worse. So they're putting these laws yeah. into place to allegedly protect the public, but they're not protecting the public and they're not following the laws they already have. And so, yeah. you know, what, you're only really criminalizing people like me who, you know, care about my dog and who treat my dog as family. I have to follow the law too, you know. And so that's the thing that people don't think about is you're punishing responsible people and the outlaws who wouldn't necessarily follow laws to begin with are the ones who you're targeting, but you're not affecting at all. You yeah. Know, it's really yeah. It's not like there's no reason to it at all. So let me, yeah, let so me that was one question. situation. Yeah. When you refer to the science, what specifically is the science pertaining to the pit bull? And I guess it's temperament or I don't know. What's the science? The science is that all dogs are individuals. You can't say that it's a genetic reasoning because pit bulls aren't an actual breed Mm -hmm. um, and all dogs come from the same place. So you're, you know, from a Weimaraner to a pit bull to a husky, they all have the same basic needs, you know, food, shelter, love. They need some Mm -hmm. kind of structure from us. They need positive training. They need to not be living in fear. So um, if you're talking about behavior, dogs are either, they're relaxed, they're fearful. Basically what you're working with here is that you have a dog that feels like it's safe you have a dog that feels unsafe or you have a dog that feels neutral. And that's the most simple version of science I can give you is that dogs are really that straightforward and we Uh overcomplicate it with all this extra stuff. So if you have a dog, for instance, that lives on a chain, that lives outside, that's unsocialized, that is laying there all day in the elements, having to hear sounds and things that it can't control and not necessarily getting food or shelter or water, right. those dogs are become an issue and a risk. And those are usually the dogs we read about in media stories as they report yeah. it as a, quote, family dog when really it's a dog living outside in a yard that's not having any kind of socialization whatsoever. And we're taking away their, their pack mentality and we're giving them a really, uh, you know, unsafe and unstructured world to live in. And so those are the dogs we read about when we read about a yeah. sort of random dog attack or things like that. But that's the true science of it is that we're yeah. putting these dogs in a situation that is really unfair and then we're expecting them to behave a certain way. And yeah, they're it's really very, simple. very sad. It's very sad. And, you know, I've even read that there's science now that says over the years with, with specific breeds that have been known to be smarter or, you know, friendlier or whatever, that that's all bogus too because all of that stuff has not been bred for in a very, very long time. And things that have been bred for are things like English bulldogs having shorter snouts so they can't breathe exactly. at all anymore or exactly. things that are more fashionable that don't serve the dog at all. So when right. people they the- have an Australian Shepherd and they're smart because they're the, one of the smartest breeds or, you know, whatever that is, it's just not true anymore. Right. And well, and the other part of it is, you know, you're, you might have a lazy, not that smart German Shepherd or Australian Shepherd. And sure, you're going to have certain traits that relate like, you know, a Husky obviously like has longer hair. So they might not be that comfortable living in 120 degree heat, you know, basic, right. simple stuff. But One of the things that people aren't really thinking about are if we're talking about, you know, behavior and we're talking about these scientific aspects of dogs, context is everything. So what you're putting into that dog is what you're usually going to get out of that dog unless that dog has, you know, a brain tumor or something pretty severe. Dogs are very predictable in that way. And so regardless of what type of dog it is, you're going to have a dog that you can get to do certain things and, you know, keep them safe, hopefully, but you have dogs that are super loyal and pit bull type dogs tend to be super loyal and that's not genetics. That's just really consistency, but they've, as a result, been taken advantage of, you know, and mm-hmm. people have really taken advantage of the fact mm-hmm. that they're so loyal that that's how they ended up in situations uh, where people were abusing them and fighting them or doing certain things. So when people talk about them as a fighting breed, that's nonsense. They come from a line certainly that was used that way in the 1800s, but that's also when we were hanging witches, you know, it's the same time. So people need to think about the context of the world that these dogs were living in that weren't doing anything other than what they were being told to do. Exactly. You know, people take advantage of that. Exactly. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back, I want to talk more about, about the breed, 
about your shoots, your fashion shoots, because I think they're just fantastic. And there's one dog that you used as a model in particular named Taco, who you referenced as a 367 survivor. We're going to find out what that is. So don't go away. Refresh that beverage. And we'll be right back. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back. Right after we kibble a little with our sponsors. The young lady from the rescue delivered happy, and I panicked. He was missing hair, stinky, scabby, and I thought, what did I get us into? The cause of his issue was poor nutrition. It was neglect. The other owners didn't care enough about him to give him the nutrition he needed. But I have a vet that I trust, and she recommended Dinovite. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. I ordered the first 90-day supply, and within a couple weeks, His skin started clearing up. He didn't smell. He had more energy. He just had a glow and a bounce about him. We've been using DinoBite for the last year, and Happy the Rescue Dog is Happy the Healthy Dog. I tell all my friends who have rescues to give their dog the chance at a new start with DinoBite. It's going to pay off for you and your dog for years to come. 859-428-1000. 859-428-1000. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E oh. dot com. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. Welcome back. You're listening to Bark and Swagger on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Jody Miller Young, and we're here today with Deirdre Franklin of Pinups for Pitbulls, one of the most visible and creative advocates for Pitbulls that I've ever met. Welcome back, Deirdre. Thank you. So you, first of all, everyone, you have to check out the pictures from the calendars that Deirdre has done under the Pinups for Pitbulls brand because they are so much fun and they're cool looking, very kitschy. And if you're a pop culture lover like I am, you're going to fall hard. But in looking through these, there was one in particular, a dog model named Taco, that you referenced as a 367 survivor. Tell us what that is. Absolutely. So three, they're called 367 dogs. They were, it was one of the largest uh, multi-state dog fighting busts that took place in the United States. There were 367 of them that were taken that day that were uh, saved from a fight bus. It turned out the final tally was closer to, I believe, 400 almost 500 dogs. Um, wow. And that was through Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and Texas um, mm-hmm. that those dogs all came from. And he was one of them. So he was pulled by a group called Bark Nation in Detroit, Michigan. And he now lives a very happy life, but he's extremely shy. It takes him a while to get warmed up. Um, but he was eating string cheese out of my husband's mouth within an hour because my husband's tenacious also. <laughs> so um, they were like best friends by the end of the day. So about half a million dollars in cash was also taken from that same fight bust. Um, in addition to, they noticed that there was a lot of gambling and other things taking place, firearms, drugs, things like that. So the dogs were pulled from a pretty crazy situation, but also something that was clearly very organized. And that was something to take into consideration. And the year before, we had a dog from Handsome Dan's Rescue named Tilly, who was also a 367 fighter. And they believe she was pulled from the same place that um, the dog was this year from Taco, or that Taco was pulled from as well. And Handsome Dan is one of the Michael Vick dogs, right? Yep. Yes, he is. And Heather, who has both had both Tilly, who just who passed last year, but he she had Tilly and still has Handsome Dan. She's the one who founded Handsome Dan's Rescue and was in I think she was April last year with Tilly in her calendar. Got it. 
Got it, got it. Yeah, um, so what we try to do with the calendar is get more exposure for all these other groups doing so much work elsewhere also. As we, like I said, we really believe in working together, but really highlighting the different things that we can all do in our, you know, in our respective places and collectively. Absolutely. I mean, we're stronger together. We're stronger together. Exactly. So where do you find your human and dog models for these shoots? Every like how, year we'd, how can sorry. people get involved who might want to? Absolutely. So first and foremost, um, people can go to our website, pinupsforpitbulls.org. There's a contact us button and a volunteer form there. We love when people volunteer with us. We have volunteers in more than 20 states now. We have teams all over the place, and we're always trying to grow um, and get more teams in different states that we don't already have people, but also where we do. Um, so that is the best way to get involved. People can do uh, take as much time as they can to volunteer, but we don't expect people to make a full-time job out of it. And then they can also apply to be part of our calendar. We have a calendar open call every year. It'll open in January on our website. So if people join our e-newsletter, they'll get first notice. But the model call is usually open for about a month or two. And it has a questionnaire and asks people to explain how do they want to get involved. Are they already involved? What do they hope to do? What do they do already? Things like that. And we're looking for people to apply by themselves, to apply with a dog, or to apply for a dog. So that way everybody can apply regardless of gender or things like that. That is wonderful. Now, you have two dogs of your own, Zoe and Baxter Bean, yes. who are pinups for Pitbull's models and who do like the coolest stuff. How do you get them to pose so beautifully for these calendar shoots? <laughs> it's actually funny. So many people think that it takes a major skill, and I think it's that we just bore them to death first. So, <laughs> <laughs> we, so when people um, end up on set with their dog at our um, calendar shoots, it's about two hours of hair and makeup usually before they actually shoot. So a lot of times the dogs have gotten there, have been really rambunctious, really excited, then they eventually fall asleep, maybe go out for a walk or two, and then they're really tired. Um, and right after that, we usually shoot the girl first. And then we'll have the dogs either join her in set or we'll shoot the dogs separately. But usually by that time, it's been like two plus hours and the dogs are so whatever at that point. <laughs> That's when they're really eager to just work for cookies and people please. Right. So. <laughs> They'll work for food. And Celeste is amazing. So she shoots everything in camera. So we don't do a lot of um, post work or Photoshop work, which is awesome. But she really sets up exactly what she wants it to look like first. And then we let the dogs kind of do their thing so we know that everything else is going to look great and then we just really work on the dog but there's a lot of whoop whoop whoops and squeaky sounds and you know <laughs> whatever it takes but there's usually about five of us kind of entertaining them at different points of the room to try to get them to look where we want and um, but it's very fun it's probably like the best one of the best things about my job is getting to meet people and dogs in this context because it's usually like they won the Miss America award when they get the call that they got into the calendar so Aww. I usually either have cries or laughs or both. So <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's the best thing ever working with dogs. I feel the it same really way. Is. It's like I pinch myself. I know. So you've done so much. My God, you've written two books. One of your books is Little Darlin's Pinups for Pitbulls. The other one, which is, I think, the most recent one, is called The Pitbull Life, A Dog Lover's Companion. Tell us a little bit about the books and where people can find them. Absolutely. So the first book, the Pinups for Pitbulls book, came out on Overlook Press um, October of the year before last. And that is a compilation of about 10 years of calendar pictures. It has a lot of like quick little quotes for people to use, um, some educational tips as well about having a pit bull type dog or about the laws affecting them. And then it has um, some rescue stories. It highlights um, friends of mine's dogs or different great dogs around the country, like Oogie, if you read the Oogie book, was in it. Um, yeah. different, different awesome dogs along the way. So we highlighted a few of their stories in the book as well. Or we, I mean I. <laughs> we as, as <laughs> pinups for pit bulls, but really... So then the second book I co-wrote with somebody named Linda Lombardi, and she's actually who called me years ago with the Associated Press and interviewed me, um, and we stayed in touch for years, and she and I really wanted to put something together from our different perspectives because she's worked in the media for so long and has so much insight on the stuff that's so abstract to me and vice versa, that we were really able to collaborate and put together a book that I, I look at as a toolkit for the future of these dogs. So I really wanted to create something that was easy to read and fun and gave some history, but really also 
empowered people to do what they can where they are in that way. You know, and Pinnister Pitbulls is doing a lot and we have a lot of great volunteers, but I feel like everybody can be doing more and it doesn't take that much. Like I said, you know, with that lunch call that we made to the Grapevine Shelter, you know, yeah. if everybody was doing little things like that where they were, we'd be a lot more accomplished, you know, this time next yeah. year and 10 years from now. So so we really wanted to put something together that was fun and read, read well, but at the same time, you know, really, really gave people the, the nuts and bolts of what they need. Because I feel like that's the only thing that's missing out there is, you know, some kind of firm place to find everything all at once. Um, yeah, yeah, the and toolkit, that also some, the toolkit. Yeah, exactly. And it has some beautiful pictures from different photographers, um, some of the Washington Humane Society dogs, which the cover picture is actually a, a puppy from Washington Humane Society in D.C., but yeah, it was a cool collaborative effort. I've never co-written a book with anybody before, so that was a learning process also for both of us. But we had a lot of fun and grew together and really like just I'm very cool. impressed with how it all came very out. I'm cool. happy with it. Yeah, and that yeah, comes out November very, 22nd. Very cool. So Thanks. what other products do you offer under the Pinups for Pitbulls brand or banner? Absolutely. So we have, on our website, we have resources. If people ever need training tips or things like that, they can download PDFs for free. But on our store, we have hats, we have hoodies, we have our calendars, we have the books, we have oh. uh, everything, I feel like. <laughs> T-shirts, tank tops, Fun. kids' clothes. Well, tell yeah. people where they can, you know, they can find this stuff and learn more about you, your work, and pities in general. Where can they go? Absolutely. They can go to pinupsforpitbulls.org. And if they want to go to the store, they can just click the shop button there or they can do backslash shop the website and they can go there. Or they can buy things on Amazon as well if they prefer. They can donate to us through smile.amazon.com or on our website button. We're always looking for grant writers or more resources, sponsors, things like that. So however people want to get involved, we're, we don't take anything as a um, cookie cutter approach. So we like to, you know, case by case everything and grow and learn together. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Deidre. If you love Thank dogs, you. my pleasure. If you love dogs and you want to learn more about a very misrepresented type of dog, go check out pinupsforpitbulls.org. Get involved in your community. When you meet a pit bull type dog, be open. And I find that when I'm open and my heart is open, animals sense everything. And I get a great reaction. So I'm really excited that you were on the show, Deidre. I think it's so important what you're doing. You're doing amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. My pleasure. And thank you all for listening. Thanks to our producer, Mark Winter. Mark makes us sound like geniuses. Thank you, Mark. My Thanks, passion. Mark. <laughs> My passion is living stylishly and animal rescue. So tune in next time to discover the styles and rescue stories I love. And don't forget to visit me at BarkinSwagger.com where you'll find great fashion, shelter stories, and more. So until next time, when fierce fashion calls, bark and swagger. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.